Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. Hello there. Hope you're well. It's Lawrence from Corporate Warrior. Thanks for tuning in for another episode. This time I interviewed Ben Greenfield. Ben is pretty impressive and I followed Ben for some time in terms of his his podcast and his website. He's got degree and master's in sports science. He's a pro triathlete, former pro triathlete, uh, New York Times bestseller, voted one of the world's top 100 most influential people in health in 2013 and 14 by NSCA. Um, And he also runs the Ben Greenfield Fitness Podcast, which you may be familiar with. It's one of the top podcasts on iTunes for health uh, and he's also involved in a number of others. This man has been seriously working hard um, to build his health and fitness business um, and I'm, I've got a lot of respect for Ben and, and the content that he puts out. This interview is really interesting. Um, I've wanted to get Ben on the show for a while because He's got a very science-driven approach to nutrition and exercise, and he has said before that he he sees the value in high-intensity strength training um, and has mentioned Body by Science and Dr. Doug McGuff. I think he's interviewed uh, Doug in the past, but yet in his... I noticed that in a lot of his training regimens, he personally does not practice high-intensity strength training. Um, And I found that to be quite interesting because I guess, in my experience, anyone who's, I guess, really understands um, the human body and and how to to produce results through exercise and really kind of latches on to high-intensity training as the primary mode of um, a way to produce, uh, to provide that stimulus to the body. Um, But... Not everyone needs to do that or, or decides to do that. Um, and when I interviewed Ben, we really got into his training regimen. You know, we got into his nutrition, um, his views on high intensity training, supplements regimes, and we also got into his um, a bit of business advice that he had for for personal trainers as well and people trying to build online health and fitness businesses like me. Um, so very very informative interview. And this interview was sponsored by hituni.com. That's H-I-T-U-N-I.com. The best online courses for high-intensity training. Whether you're trying to just improve your own results or you want to become a fantastic personal trainer in high-intensity training, visit the website and enter, add your desired course to cart and enter the coupon code CW10 and you get a 10% discount. Why wouldn't you? And you'll also help support this show. Um, if you can't remember that, go to my website, corpwarrior.com. That's C O R P warrior spelled out.com. Um, and the URL and information will be on the blog post as in the show notes, sorry, for, for this podcast. Um, I hope you enjoy the show. Oh, and I hope you're enjoying these mini introductions. Um, hopefully they are entertaining and informative um, and I'll, I will continue to try and improve those. But enjoy the show and please share, review, like, email as much as you can because it really helps me out. All the best. Ben Greenfield, you are a speaker um practitioner and consultant in health and fitness you have a ba and masters in sports science and exercise physiology by the way you have the longest bio of any guest i've had on here so yeah um, i probably i probably wouldn't read it honestly (laughs) really well i will (laughs) save yourself the time i will because it's so impressive (laughs) okay go go ahead i'm i'm walk i'm walking on my treadmill right now so i'll see how far i can go while you're doing your thing. I love that. I love the fact that you're doing that right now. I'm standing, but not walking, but it's all good. Um, but please uh, correct me if I get any of this wrong. So I'll keep okay. going. Um, so you've got a strength and conditioning certification from NSCA, who also said that you were one of the most influential people in health and fitness in 2013 and 14. I don't know if that also um, is for 15, but I guess maybe it's decided at the end of the year. I don't know. Let's, let's keep our fingers crossed, I guess. I'm, I'm sure it will be. Um, you are a former pro triathlete. Uh, I don't know if you're still currently professional. I'm assuming... Uh, n- not really, no. I'm, re- I'm still racing triathlon. I race for Team Timex, and uh, 
you know, still try and keep myself relatively fast, but I'm not, you know, I'm not racing for paychecks or anything like that. <laughs> no worries. Um, author of New York Times bestseller, Beyond Training. Um, you're a top ranked personal trainer, um, 11 years plus uh, coach uh, for recreational, collegiate and professional athletes on health, fitness and nutrition. Um, and your podcast is... Uh, ben Greenfield Fitness is one of the top health and fitness podcasts on iTunes um, and I believe your other podcasts are doing pretty well also so um, you've been hustling and working very hard uh, and I've obviously listened to a lot of your stuff and very very inspiring so hopefully that covers it (laughs) cool awesome and uh, it's always fun to talk to people with weird accents like you Oh, I appreciate it, and it's (laughs) no, I'm uh, that's awesome. I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you enjoy it. Cool. Okay. So as you know, uh, well, as you'll you're, you're begin to find out, this podcast is heavily inspired by um, the high intensity strength training movement. Um, I was personally hot, very inspired by uh, Body by Science by Doug McGuff um, and a lot of the other guys in that uh, sort of exercise niche. Um, what I find very interesting about you is you're, you're very science driven and you're very intelligent um exercise practitioner um and it's like with you it's you've you've you know you understand high intensity strength training very well yet you've decided rather than go right i'm going to consolidate my training and just do this you still do so much and that fascinates me and because a lot of people that get into high intensity training you know like, like myself um, reduce everything else and just consolidate, which I think potentially comes with some problems. Um, so my first question to you is, do you still, do you currently perform any type of high-intensity strength training? Well, can you define what you mean by high-intensity strength training? Because sometimes that yeah. means high velocity, low force. Sometimes it means uh, high force, low velocity, like that, you know, like that super slow approach. Sometimes you know, in some cases, um, you know, for some, uh, you know, uh, not power lifters, but Olympic weightlifters more can mean high force, high velocity. So mm. what, what exactly do you mean? Okay. So if you, so I guess a good, um, example is kind of the body by science approach. So super slow, right. um, you know, lo- uh, 10 second plus cadence on the, uh, the, the exercise itself, um, right. you know, weight right. training, whether it be, um, free weights or machines uh, performed infrequently. Yeah. Yeah. So for the purposes of increasing peripheral blood pressure, which is one of the main advantages of that uh, body by science approach in terms of of driving blood flow back to the heart without an increase in central blood pressure, which is kind of, kind of one great aspect of that routine uh, for the advantages of maintaining localized, very high levels of lactic acid, which can, uh, well, I mean, when you, when you build up a bunch of lactic acid, you not only get a bigger anabolic hormonal response to your strength training, like growth hormone to, and testosterone, but you also increase the ability of your body to buffer lactic acid and also to send lactic acid uh, back to the liver via the Cori cycle to get reconverted into glucose. So for that benefit as well, and then uh, finally for the benefit of a low impact way to build strength without putting undue stress on the joints, I am a fan of that approach as well as the approach of using isometrics. And so, yes, about once every week, I'll do either an isometric type of strength training protocol. And that's usually, honestly, mixed in with uh, with some kind of a yoga routine where I'm kind of moving through poses and holding for anywhere from two to five minutes, lunge poses, squat poses, things along those lines to make yoga a little bit more difficult and a little bit more lactic acid intensive but then also lifting slowly, smoothly, and under a great deal of control with anywhere from that 10 to 30 second rep tempo is something else that I'll do on a week where I've done less isometrics or I've done uh, not any of that kind of super slow, uh, uh, a higher force, low velocity type of approach. So just like anything, um, I don't think that it is the only way that one should train, but I think that including sessions like that 
in which you're, you're moving a high amount of force slowly uh, definitely has benefits. And then there's also, in my opinion, psychological benefits, right? Like you almost have to get into a little bit of a meditative state or a state of extreme focus in order to be able to, rather than throwing things around like a, you know, like a wild Muppet at the gym, instead moving slowly and under control with breath control. So I think there's a positive aspect there as well. Cool. Do you recommend it to your clients sometimes? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it is it is a staple of the routine that most of my clients do and typically um, is something that we'll use a lot when traveling with access to limited equipment for like super slow or isometric bodyweight routines. We'll also use it uh, during, for example, the race season when there's a lot of high intensity interval training and impact based training being done via things like uh, running and cycling and obstacle course training and swimming. And so the actual weight training time, I like for that to be just a, a little bit lower impact or at least have a session devoted to lower impact strength building. Mm. Um, I, I remember you saying about how uh, the big five from Doug's Body by Science, um, you were discussing this with Dave Asprey, um, you think is a great exercise template for the average person. Um, sorry, you, th- you said it's one component of an exercise template for the average person. Do you feel that alone is adequate for for someone who's not a high performance athlete, like you know a lot of your clients and yourself in the book? Um, yeah. So what, you mean what do you, you mean like that? just just doing super slow training in the gym, either using machines or using free weights, or using body weight? Exactly, because my, my point is a lot of people just to just to expand on that. A lot of people in the high intensity training field. I'm not saying I agree with this. But they, they believe that it's adequate to perform high intensity strength training, you know, once a week for 15 to 15 minutes. And yeah. that, that whilst they acknowledge that being, say, holding a, a static position for a long period of time, like sitting at a desk is not good for you, that you can get away with doing that once a week and then the rest of your exercise being just basic movement. Um, yeah. 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 So here's my take on that. First of all, is it adequate? Probably, although there's no research to show that, you know, but especially as you get older and, you know, perhaps you have a little bit less ability to go out and do the more extreme things, or even, you know, if you get to the point where your joints are keeping you from, from doing things like, you know, playing tennis or basketball or soccer or engaging in cross training, certainly you could probably rely upon that as a way to maintain cardiovascular fitness, control blood pressure, maintain strength, stave off sarcopenia or muscle loss, and it, it'd probably work. But at the same time, you know, you could say something similar about nutrition, right? Like you could probably have a smoothie for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if you had the right things in that smoothie, the right mixes of macronutrients, carbs, proteins, fats, you know, if you had the right mix of vegetables and, and oils and amino acids that you could probably satisfy all your dietary needs for the rest of your life. However, when you look at things from an ancestral standpoint, aside from the fact that it could become boring and repetitive, and so there may be a uh, low propensity for good adherence to a program like that, you know, burnout on a program like that, that consists solely of one form of eating or one form of exercise. You could say that when you look at, at our ancestors, you know, hunting, gathering, moving, farming, fighting, experiencing both impact and low impact, experiencing various forms of exercise, various loads, various forms of ambulation, high intensity cardio, low intensity, steady state cardio, lifting heavy things very fast once, such as as flipping something or hoisting something or throwing something, and also lifting things uh, slowly and under control, you know, such as moving moving a plow or, or transporting a wheelbarrow from point A to point B, you could say that I would think you'd be best served with a mix of activities rather than one mode of activity. So anytime I see an argument for one specific dietary approach or one specific exercise approach, an eyebrow goes up in terms of whether or not that's something that is sustainable or ancestral. Uh, that's, that's really interesting. So you, you raised some really... Um reasonable concerns about just having that as your primary protocol for exercise um is what else do you dislike if anything about the kind of high intensity strength training niche 
Uh, the fact that it's done uh, primarily, unless it's been modified, in a seated position, which can put undue stress on the low back, and which for people who maybe already are sitting at their workplace or in their day-to-day -day lives every day, the last thing I like to see is going to the gym to sit some more. Mm -hmm. So that's a potential weakness. Obviously, a leg press can be modified to become a squat. A pull-down can become modified to be a, a standing row or a pull-up. A shoulder press on the machine can be modified to become a standing shoulder press, a, you know, chest press modified to a super slow push-up or even like a loaded push-up or a standing cable chest press. You get the idea. Like, you know, you can modify many of the traditional exercises in this type of training to become a little bit more uh, more functional from a standing standpoint. So that's, that's one thing that I think can be an issue. The other is that sometimes if, again, you're, you're relegated to using machines and going to the gym, one of the problem with problems with gyms, especially if you're living in a stressful environment at your office um, or elsewhere during your life, is you're stepping into a situation where you are exposed to endocrine disruptors like colognes and perfumes. You're exposed to EMF from televisions and other things scattered around the gym. You're exposed to, uh, you know, the potential for, for mold and off-gassing and carpet. I think a lot of gyms are very unhealthy places to be, ironically, in the same way that a lot of hospitals are very unhealthy places to be. So that's something else to consider, you know, whether you, um, where, where your workout setting is. And that's not to say that you can't achieve, you know, this type of training in your in your home or in your backyard, but it's just something else to think about. Cool. I recently heard. Well, I guess this this podcast you did was probably ages ago. Um, obviously, in research for this one, I, I did a bit of extensive research on you and some of the interviews you've done. Um, and I, I found it fascinating when you started talking about in one podcast um, a high fat diet in relation to muscle building. You said how fat can be. Um, how fatty acids can be used to help build muscle. Um, could you elaborate on that and just, I guess, describe it perhaps more at a scientific level how that can help someone try to build muscle mass? Yeah, absolutely. I think what you're referring to was the fact that you can actually have a lipophilic, con lip lipophilic content in, in like the intramuscular spaces or the ability to store fat muscularly that can be tapped into via beta oxidation to produce ATP. Many of us think of our muscles as storehouses for water, for glycogen, for electrolytes, for small amounts of creatine, etc. But you can actually store some fat that can be relied upon as an energy source. And so that's that's one thing to think about um, is that you know you can you can cleave the, the glycerol backbone of fats to actually help you to do things like produce glucose that could potentially be used for glycolysis or to be used uh, for, uh, or, you know, the, the fat itself to be used as for, uh, or via beta oxidation to produce ATP. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the main thing is that you, uh, you can use fat for energy. And of course, the other consideration here when we're talking about fats is when you are eating a, a slightly higher fat diet or engaging in some of the things that allow you to oxidize more fats like um, intermittent fasting or uh, you know the, the use of, of higher fat meals, um, what happens is you can increase your ability to oxidize fats during exercise. You actually increase or rather decrease what's called your respiratory quotient or your, your fat to carb burning ratio. And because of that, it not only has a glycogen sparing effect, but it also can help with things like increasing mitochondrial density since you're going to need more mitochondria when you're burning more fat as a fuel versus, uh, you know, burning, burning more, more sugar as a fuel or engaging in, in something like glycolysis. So, um, that, you know, that, that's another advantage is just that glycogen sparing fat oxidation effect, more burning of fat, both during rest and during exercise. Very cool. Um, ben, what are your current fitness goals? My current fitness goals, well, number one is, is to just stay healthy and, and you know, kind of engage in, in anti-aging as much as possible by uh, maintaining strength, maintaining VO2 max, et cetera, as I get closer and closer to being in the, in the latter half of my life. 
Um, I'm also uh, really focusing on becoming very good at, at obstacle course racing, specifically uh, Spartan racing. I'm kind of doing uh, some bucket list events from like a triathlon standpoint. Like I'll probably be going over to do Norse Man. I may go race in, in Thailand again this year, um, mostly for for both journalism, right, to write for magazines, but also to just kind of see the world and and uh, see it from from uh, running shoes in the back of a bike and a wetsuit rather than seeing it by sitting in a tour bus. And um, you know, just basically to stay as strong as vibrant as possible. I'm also doing quite a bit of training for uh, for hunting and and uh, bow hunting specifically, just so I can I can tap a little bit more into the natural resources uh, where I live at in Washington State. Cool. Uh, and just, I can't remember if we said before I introduced your uh, biography, but love the fact that you are walking on a treadmill right now. Is it quite a brisk pace? I'm probably walking about, I would say, uh, three and a half miles an hour right now. Cool. Okay. No, I love that. Um, I remember when you were on London Real. I'm, I'm, uh, I know I'm familiar with Brian Rose, and uh, you know, I'm a big fan of his podcast. Um, you spoke about your focus on obstacle racing, which you know I, I'm a big fan of. I personally, I've done Survival of the Fittest for the last few years. Um, are you familiar with that? That's that's mm, the obstacle race. Not, not really. I don't. I, I think I've seen advertisements for that one before, but I've never done it. No worries. It's a it's a uh, men's health UK based race. So that's okay, right. yeah. Um, so when you when you say when you're on that podcast, you said that one of your goals was to be one of the top racers uh, before you're forty. And how are you tracking against that? Out of interest. How am I tracking again? I don't even know what tracking against means. Is that a is that a, oh, a British sorry. term? <laughs> <laughs> Probably. What I what I mean is, you know, how are you? How, do you feel like um, you are one of the top obstacle racers, or have you got, in your opinion, some way to go to be that? Or how do you how do you measure that? I suppose. Well, I was like twenty third place at, at world championships. You know, I'm definitely one of the top fifty in the world, but. I would say I have yet to crack like the top five or something like that. I'm one of those guys who, um, I'm, I'm a planner. I'm a patient guy. I take a while to, to plan and build my fitness. So I would say it'll probably be another couple of years before I've got my, my running speed down to, uh, down to where it needs to be. I would say my, my strength and skill is where it needs to be. I just need to get a little bit faster, more fleet of foot. And, uh, yeah, so that's the main thing I'm doing a lot of like, higher cadence repeat, starting to run a little bit uh, more in terms of quality, even though I'm not a huge fan of running. It's definitely something that is a crucial skill in events like that, you know, especially like the, the longer events, like the uh, the 13 plus mile obstacle course races. So, um, so yeah, typical, typical week for me is, you know, right now I, I can actually lay it out for you. Yeah, please do. Um, yeah. So let's start with a, uh, Mondays is typically like the first day of the week for me. And right now I'm doing more, uh, more, uh, cycling on Mondays. So typically the, the morning on Monday is about 30 minutes of yoga. And then the afternoon is typically some kind of a, a cycling, um, usually mountain biking, road biking, or time trialing on the triathlon bike, any of those. Then, uh, Tuesday, um, Tuesday morning, I do what I call run, lift, shoot, where you're running, uh, either with a weighted pack or without a weighted pack, you're lifting, you know, sandbags, tires, stuff like that. And then shooting, uh, and that's, that's shooting a bow specifically at a target, uh, usually with a, with a heart rate that's high. And usually all that's done as a circuit. And then uh, Tuesday afternoon is strength training. Um, Wednesday is my easy day or my off day or my recovery day, whatever you want to call it. That day I'm doing uh, typically a lot of cold water swimming, usually about 20 to 30 minutes of cold water immersion and cold thermogenesis. And then uh, typically at some point in the afternoon, I'm sitting in a sauna for anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. And usually on that easy day, I'm also doing anywhere from uh, 30 to 60 minutes of yoga or Tai Chi or some type of, of mobility type of workout. I also do a lot of foam rolling on Wednesdays. And usually I'll listen to an audio book or a podcast or something like that and hit the foam roller for about a half hour or so. Um, Thursdays is the same as Tuesdays. I lift, run, and shoot, and then I do uh, strength training in the in the afternoon or the early evening. What is? Uh, can you elaborate on the strength training element? Well, it varies based on the time of year, mm -hmm. right? So right now, 
because I'm kind of in race season, my strength training is a lot of lighter, high velocity stuff, right? Like, uh, tire flips, uh, sandbag thrusters, um, uh, a lot of, uh, squats, cleans, deadlifts, and a little bit faster pace, a little bit lighter weight. Um, you know, whereas for example, like in the, in the fall or the winter, it would be heavier things, right? Like, a like a five by five protocol, you know, where I'm doing five sets of five reps of like a, you know, squat, deadlift, clean, that type of thing. So it kind of varies throughout the year. Right now it's a lot more functional stuff though. And that'll even include things like rope climbs, rope swings, um, pull-ups, even CrossFit workouts, right? Like, uh, Murph, for example, you know, where it's just like run a mile, hundred pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 squats, run a mile, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's Thursday and, and Tuesday that I'll do strength training like that. Um, Friday is a free day, meaning that that can be anything from, you know, tennis to soccer to basketball cool. to all of the above to pretty much, you know, any, anything I feel like doing really on a Friday. Um, as long as it's, it's something, it's not like an easy day like Wednesday is, but it's just kind of like, it's a, it's a free day. Sure. It's just go, you know, sometimes it'll be, it'll be, uh, you know, playing capture the flag or paintball, you know, it just, just depends. Saturday is, is the one day that's like the day that you dread. <laughs> that's, that's the hard day. That's where I'll do a good uh, 90 minutes to two hours of hardcore training and usually a combination of cardio and strength training. So for me right now, that's obstacle course training. We're all set up a circuit and the circuit will, will be like a two mile long circuit that includes everything from bear crawling to dragging cinder blocks to tire flips to rope climbs to rope swings. Um, you sandbag carries, you name it. And it'll just be a hardcore circuit for a good 90 minutes to two hours, typically just done AMRAP style, right? As many rounds as possible. You know, so typically I'm just getting crushed on Saturdays. And then Sunday is family day. It doesn't really matter what I do as long as it's with the family. So we'll go on a hike, we'll go on a bike ride, we'll go on a walk, you know, whatever, whatever I'll, I'll want to do to kind of hang out with the kids, hang out with the family. Sometimes if it I'm feeling really beat up from Saturday's workout or if I've tested my heart rate variability, which I do every morning to track my recovery. Mm -hmm. If my heart rate variability is really low, I'll just, you know, take Sunday as an easy day and make it kind of like Wednesday, right? Like more kind of easy swimming, sauna, yoga, stuff like that. So that's kind of how the week shakes up right now. Cool. So um, I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit here, but you talked about a couple of strength training sessions. Now, um, a lot of the people in the kind of evidence-based exercise slash high-intensity training field will say, well, why are you doing tire flipping, etc., when you could just stick a very short and brief high-intensity strength training regimen once a week, continue doing all the other, obviously, skill-based stuff, um, and then be done with it. So why, why is it that you decided rather to do what you do instead of that? Well, the answer is pretty obvious because that's what I'm doing in my competition. Ah. Right? Like it's the same reason that a tennis player would go <laughs> hit a bunch of tennis balls. I got I to gotta flip tires and climb ropes when I'm competing. And, and do you feel that the strength training you do, well, <laughs> it's probably, again, another obvious one, but the strength training that you do as part of your regimen is enough to maintain the strength and muscle mass that you wish to, to, to maintain throughout your, for your current goals? Uh, considering I'm about 185 pounds, 6% body fat with, uh, excellent biomarkers, I would say the answer is yeah. <laughs> yes, I would. And, and I'm will I'm willing to, to put this out there right now. I'm one of the fittest guys on the planet. Um, so yes, it's, it's working just fine. The other thing to bear in mind, you know, when you're looking at research is, you know, they've, they've done research. There's a really interesting study last year in the journal of strength conditioning research that compared strongman style training, right? Like axle pulls and tire flips and atlas rock, rock carries with traditional, right? Like squats, deadlifts, clean, stuff like that. And they found that the strongman style training maintained just as much strength, power, muscular endurance, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it's, it's, it's fine to mix things up and, you know, go get a, go get a keg and fill it up with water and carry that up and down a hill where if you don't feel like whatever, doing some deadlifts. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. It's, uh, when one gets when one goes from perhaps a very strength training routine to high intensity training, to, you know it's important not to forget that you can still get yeah. the results through, like you said, being being quite varied in your approach. Um, yeah, as long plus as it's it's, mm. it's fun too, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and that was my other question: is uh, you know, again, you are you are incredibly 
um, science driven and I really admire that about you. Um, but does that always, I mean, how much of that kind of focus on the science and evidence behind what you do um, uh, dictates your actual exercise mobility, et cetera, et cetera, um, routines or versus, oh, you know, I really enjoy doing X. Yeah. Well, part of it is intuitive, right? Like for example, the research that doing hypoxic swim training, right? Like actually doing uh, restricted breath swim training, like swimming and breathing every eight strokes or, you know, swimming with like a, like a snorkel that restricts airflow. The evidence that that improved efficiency and economy for runners did not even exist until two months ago. But I've been doing that for like three years, and I've always sensed and felt that it helped me when I'm running. I've always felt that it, that it helped my lungs and it helped my oxygen utilization, even though there wasn't any science to prove it until recently. And so a lot of times when I do something, it's simply because it feels efficacious, right? Like the same thing could be said for, well, kind of along the same lines, like ice baths, for example, there's not a ton of evidence to show that they reduce inflammatory cytokines or that they decrease delayed onset muscle soreness, but they do for me, right? And so, uh, um, well, I, I can't say that they reduce inflammatory cytokines because I don't measure that variable post ice bath, but I do know it leaves me less sore and it gives me a better workout the next day. So I do it. And so some of, some of the things I do by feel based on knowing my own body rather than simply just sticking to the science. Good, good answer. Um, let's talk about nutrition. Um, do you mind giving uh, us a kind of snapshot, like a daily snapshot of what you currently eat? Yeah, I eat the same thing for breakfast and lunch. So right now I, I wake up in the morning and um, you know, I'll typically have some after I've done like my meditation and my yoga and kind of my morning practice, usually done a little bit of a cold shower or a cold soak. I, uh, I have a cup of coffee and um, usually I'm, I'm not eating breakfast until 9, 9.30ish. I follow a 12-hour intermittent fasting protocol just about every day where I'll, I'll have 12 hours for each 24-hour cycle where I'm not eating. Just so I get a little bit of cellular cleanup, give my digestive system a bit of a break. Um, and, and so that means, you know, if I, whatever, if I stop eating dinner at 8 p.m., I won't eat until 8 a.m. Or if I get up at midnight to have a snack, I won't eat again until, say, lunch the next day. So cool. typically breakfast, 9, 9.30ish, and it's just a smoothie almost every morning. And it's usually just a, a combination of superfoods and vegetables and fats. So typical smoothie will be something like kale, a little bit of beet juice, coconut milk, Do you some cook almonds, the kale? some, Do you cook some walnuts. Uh, no, I, I soak them a little bit in some water, but I don't cook them straight out. Usually it's just a, a hot water rinse. Um, what else is in there? Usually a little bit of like a pea or a rice or a hemp protein powder because I find it agrees with my digestive system better than a whey protein isolate. You know, usually about 20 to 30 grams of a protein. Um, sometimes some, some olive oil or some avocado oil or some coconut oil, usually a little bit of dark chocolate, uh, like a dark chocolate powder, like a cacao powder. Um, and then I'll blend all of that and have that with like some, some unsweetened coconut flakes or some cacao nibs or something like that stirred in for a little bit of a crunch. And that's pretty much breakfast every morning. Um, and between breakfast and lunch, which is usually anywhere from four to six hours, uh, all I'll really take in is water. Occasionally I'll have a little bit of green tea or some adaptogenic herbs, um, you know, like Eleuthero or ashwagandha or ginseng or, you know, one of these herbal complexes or teas. Mm -hmm. But generally it's really not much at all in terms of snacking. Uh, lunch every day for me is a salad, usually more vegetables, carrots, tomatoes, cabbage, parsley, cilantro, spinach, kale, uh, you name it. Tons of vegetables, typically served with lots of olive oil, along with avocados, olives, more seeds or nuts like pumpkin seeds, usually um, some fish like sardines or uh, mackerel or anchovies or some kind of like a cold water fish. And uh, that's that's it for lunch. Um, in the afternoon, usually pre-workout, uh, if it's a if it's a higher intensity day, like a Tuesday or a Thursday, I'll have a little bit of coconut milk with a little bit of protein powder. So I'll get some medium chain triglycerides and some amino acids into my system before I work out. Uh, and then uh, post-workout, typically I will have a glass of wine just because the, 
the fructose in the wine is a little bit less metabolically damaging when it's going straight into restore liver glycogen levels uh, <laughs> versus you know being taken with dinner. Yeah, strategic dosing of my my <laughs> glass of wine, um, and a lot of times I'll have amino acids along with that too, just to, for to to bring my blood levels of amino acids back up post workout because many times I won't be eating dinner for you know one to two hours after I've finished my workout, and then dinner is the one meal that varies, right? Like sometimes it'll be Taco Tuesday, sometimes we'll have, you know, pad thai, sometimes steak, sometimes, you know, fish with roasted vegetables. It kind of varies based off of whatever myself or my wife or my kids kind of want to cook. Um, and that is, that's, that's pretty much it. That's what a day of nutrition looks like. As far as supplementation, I kind of use a shotgun approach with a really good multivitamin that I take in the morning and the evening. I use one made by a company called Exos. Uh, the Exos AM PM formula. And then I use uh, creatine, about five grams of creatine every morning. I use a fish oil, about two grams of an EPA DHA mix. Uh, that's also in the morning with breakfast. Uh, if I'm not eating a high amount of fermented foods or I am traveling, I will take a probiotic with bigger, more complex meals like a large steak. I will use a, uh, a digestive enzyme complex prior to the meal. Um, and those are the biggies. You know, occasionally on a tough workout day, I'll throw in some things that help to mitigate soreness like curcumin or proteolytic enzymes or something that helps out a little bit from a workout recovery standpoint. But a lot of times it, it just depends on, uh, on the day, you know, whether or not I'm, I'm injured or really beat myself up or something along those lines. So that's kind of what the nutrition looks like. Cool. How do you ever cycle off supplements for like a week or more? Yeah. So, um, a lot of times, like if I'm using a specific adaptogen, you know, or an adaptogenic herb complex, like Tian Chi is one of my favorites, for example, I don't use that any more than four to five days of the week. Make sure I cycle off for a couple of days. Um, what else? Fish oil is one I'll take year round. Multivitamin I'll take year round. Uh, creatine now, cause I'm just using lower doses, I take that year round now too. I used to cycle it, but I don't anymore. I just take it every day. There's no evidence that, that you need to cycle it. Um, so those are, those are, uh, yeah, there, I don't really take that much that needs to be cycled. There's been times in my life when I've used an herbal testosterone complex, um, to, to increase, uh, total testosterone levels. And when I've done that, that's also been a five day on two day off type of protocol, uh, along with eight weeks on four weeks off. So, kind of a double cycle approach with that, but there's no hard and fast rule that you have to just stop certain supplements to reset your sensitivity. Um, there are some supplements that, that, that is the case with, uh, like caffeine, you know, I'll, I'll use three weeks of caffeinated and then a week of decaf. Mm -hmm. So for every couple of bags of, of regular coffee that I go through, I go through about half bag of decaf just to make sure that my adenosine receptors basically get resensitized to the effects of caffeine because what happens when you just have caffeine ad libitum, you, you build more and more receptors. You need more and more endogenous uh, adenosine produced, which is what makes you sleepy, to fill up those receptors. And you eventually get to the point where you don't sleep quite as well. So that's why it's important to kind of do a reboot for about seven to ten days every few weeks from the uh, from caffeine or coffee. That's another one that I'll cycle a little bit. But, you know, as far as like stopping all supplements and quitting cold turkey, I know there's that kind of like philosophy out there, uh, but it's very woo woo, right? There's no research that says you just got to stop a supplement, stop taking it. That, you know, you, you could potentially say, well, if you're going to use like the approach that you were going to just stop putting anything into your body to give your digestive system a break, like fasting, there's some evidence out there that from a caloric standpoint, there are some benefits to going for periods of time without eating, like doing a, you know, a, a day long or a couple of day fast or something like that. And I suppose if you're looking at it from that standpoint, from just like stress on the digestive system, then you could say, okay, well, stopping supplements at the same time that you're fasting might make sense. But as far as like you becoming um, desensitized to the effects of, of most things like vitamin D or vitamin K or vitamin A or minerals, that doesn't happen. And those are not the type of supplements that you need to cycle. Cool. Okay. Um, coffee, what brand do you use? Do you drink? Uh, I vary. I, I use like a, I always use like an Arabica blend, preferably grown in a, in a high altitude climate. That's going to be a little bit more mold free. 
you know, like Costa Rica or Tanzania. Uh, mm-hmm. Typically, I'll use either a blend uh, from a from a, a local place uh, near to where I live in Idaho uh, called Bootsers, which is like this. Uh, it's a coffee that I grew up on and used all through all through college, but it's just like a a really good uh, small batch roast company uh, down in Moscow, Idaho, near where I live. So I'll use that or I'll use uh, the Dave Asprey's uh, upgraded coffee. The, I like their Swiss water process for decaf. So it's a really good safe decaf to drink. And I like the taste of, uh, of most of their coffees. Mm-hmm. Cool. Now you, you, um, you kind of hinted at where you potentially cheat in your diet, uh, maybe in the evenings uh, when you do your sort of family meals. Is that is that accurate? Do you do you kind are you kind of more liberal in your eating in the evenings, or do you sometimes just go you just screw? It, I'm just going to have a pizza and a ton of sugar. Or how do you how do you manage those um, those temptations? Well, I don't I don't cheat. I think that's kind of a I mean part. I got I don't want to be offensive, but I think that's kind of a dumb way to think about things because it'd be like saying okay, well every once in a while I go out in the backyard and eat some of the dog shit, right? Like. It's just no. I don't. I don't go out and, and eat pizza or ice cream just because it's so bad for you and it tastes bad and it's cheap food and it's just it's it's not in my opinion even something that I would go out of my way to eat even if it were given to me for free. I'd give it to someone I didn't like because it's a good way to slowly kill yourself. Um, if I'm going to use any semblance of the word cheat, all it means is I might have an extra helping of of coconut ice cream or, you know, uh, an, an extra glass of a, of a nice organic red wine or something like that, you know, something that, that actually is good for you, that, that tastes good. And I would say the only form of cheating might come in the case of a few extra calories. And even that, um, I cannot tell you the last time that I pushed myself away from a table completely full, unable to eat more. It's simply not really something I do. I'm too aware of the potent anti-aging effects of stopping when you're 80% full and the problems with being in, in a continual anabolic state when it comes to carcinogenic or, or uh, kind of like a fast forwarded or advanced aging process, I simply don't do it um, because I, I know the benefits of caloric control, of moderation, of delayed gratification and of eating foods that are actually real foods that are good for you. So, um, so no, I don't really cheat. Mm. I can't tell you the last time I had pizza or ice cream because I feel bad for the people that are eating it when I'm around them. That's fascinating. And uh, I don't take offense at all. And um, I think that's, that's, I mean, that is so rare to hear someone say something like that. Um, and I completely understand your point. I guess it's, um, so... Just to just so I understand, so you you don't think that like, I get it. Like when you eat, you know, um, a lot of this sort of processed food, you feel like crap afterwards. Um, but I guess you know I I don't want to like point anyone out. But let, let, if we if we look at a slow carb diet, for example, do you feel like that cheat day is 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 very detrimental? Uh, depend uh, yeah, again, if we're talking about the traditional sense of the word cheat, mm-hmm. meaning like going out and eating a bunch of things that aren't really food and that are very bad for the body. Yes. I consider that to, uh, to, to be deleterious for you in the same way that I would consider, um, cheating on my wife by going out and, you know, sticking my genitals in some, you know, STD infused prostitute would be (laughs) bad for you. It's just like, yeah, I mean, it's just not something I do because it's, it's, it's stupid and foolhardy and obviously bad for you. Um, you know, there is that argument to be made by some people, uh, you know, and they'll say, oh, but that's what makes me happy. And say, okay, well, then if, you know, going out in the backyard and, you know, shoving your nose in, in dog shit makes you happy, then I'm not going to stop you. Sure. But I still think it's stupid. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's so interesting to hear you say this. Um, so... Are you telling me, because I remember hearing a podcast a while back where, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that now and again you might knock back a few beers. Is that not the case anymore for you? Well, sure, but if I knock back a beer, it's an organic uh, microbrew 
from really good sources that's a, that tastes fantastic and is good for me. And it's not some high fructose corn syrup, GMO infused, you know, Michelob or something like that. It's like, once again, um, and, and then we're, we come full circle to the fact that that's not cheating. That's just living. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, again, it, it all depends on your definition of the word cheat. And if the word cheat for you means taking some, some years off your life or putting a bunch of crap into your body that causes you to go one step forward and two steps back, I don't think it's cheating. I think it's just stupidity. Yeah. No, I, I or think that, that, that or weak willpower. Sure. Sure. No, I, um, when I say cheat, yeah, I guess I suppose I am, I am referring to, um, you know, high, high sugar, um, high, uh, heavily processed food primarily. Um, so yeah, yeah. um, that's, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, yeah. cool. Okay. Has that, has that kind of view on, uh, your whole view on nutrition and moving away from that type of food, has that become more of a part of your lifestyle as the years have gone by or have you, always, have you been like that for a long time? Um, it's probably become more of a part of my lifestyle. I certainly did do a lot of like pizza and hamburgers and processed cereals and stuff like that when I was growing up because I didn't know any better and I didn't know the difference and I'd never really been introduced to real tasty, nutrient rich ancestral foods. But as I've delved more deeply into the science of nutrition and the type of things that are good for you and what our ancestors ate, and that's simply the way that I've grown to eat. And, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, this, this was a, this is an analogy that isn't of my, uh, invention, but it's one that, that, uh, my friend, uh, Daniel Vitalis uses, you know, he says, well, you know, once you've, once you've, uh, gotten yourself a, a Tesla or a Ferrari or a Lamborghini or a Cadillac or a Bentley, um, you don't keep your, you know, old Honda Civic from 1997, that's beat up and dented with the cracked windshield in the garage, just so occasionally you can experience all the all the benefit and the joy that you get out of driving that old piece of crap around, right? Mm. And it's kind of the same concept. Like now that I have grass-fed steak and wild-caught fish and homegrown kale and heirloom tomatoes around my house, I don't longingly glance up at the peanut butter Captain Crunch when I walk into the grocery store. For me, that's like poor man's food, right? That, that I wouldn't go near because it's cheap subsidized crap that I am, I am past now, right? Like I'm past that, that point in my life where I, I either have the weakness or the belief that that is healthy for me, or I have the desire or the longing for that. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's just one of those things where, you know, it's, it's, it's just a, a cheap and, and, Non non luxurious alternative to to the life that I live now. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, okay, so I guess we got um, if you don't mind, perhaps eight minutes maximum. Um, I'm 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 obviously keen to get your views on perhaps your favorite books and uh, your contact details, etc. For the listeners, but I just really like to ask you. You know how I mean, you're you're you are you are someone who is so active on your business uh, and a lot of the listeners I have are buddy, uh, personal trainers who want to build their business and um, what are your sort of top your top kind of um, your p- top piece of advice for the personal trainer who's listening who wants to grow their business um, to the level that your business is at sure I would say three things come to mind the first is to create content every day that goes above and beyond just working time for money, right? It goes above and beyond just like the, you know, counting reps or creating personal training programs for people. But that is actually an audio, an article, a video, or some piece of content that can live online forever or that you can monetize or that drives traffic back to you every single day. So 365 days a year, like Christmas morning, I'll write an article, record an audio or shoot a video. My birthday, Thanksgiving, you name it. Every single day of the week, 365 days a year, I create at least one piece of content that helps people. So that would be number one. Number two, uh, I would say would be to do whatever is the hardest thing first. If the hardest thing for you is the content, then get up early and produce the content. If the hardest thing for you 
is getting into a yoga practice or meditation or visualization, do that. If the hardest thing for you is hiring a, an assistant to help you or creating some kind of training materials that allow you to clone yourself, start working on doing that first. But pick the one hardest thing that you dread doing and get that out of the way first every single day. And then the third uh, would be to, as much as possible, uh, get rid of newspapers and television. Just basically try to eliminate those from your life. They're both some of the biggest time sucks that used to be in my life that are simply really not a part of my vernacular every year. I read a newspaper about once every two or three weeks. Um, I watch a maximum of about an hour of television each week, and that vastly increases my productivity and my ability to be able to delve into the things that truly benefit both myself and, and the people around me. Awesome. That's really good advice. What are your, uh, your top recommendations for books on health and fitness? Um, it's a good question. I would say for nutrition, one that comes to mind is the book uh, Deep Nutrition by Dr. Kate Shanahan. It's a really, really good one to get your head wrapped around like ancestral nutrition. Kind of up there as well as there's a book called The Belly Fat Effect. Kind of a weird name, but it's really, really good at delving into like our, our, how our microbiome affects our, our brain and the rest of our function. And I believe it's Mike Mutzel that wrote that one. Um, so those are, those are a couple of really good books for nutrition. For training, I would say um, one, of, one of the ones that I kind of get a kick out of when I'm trying to come up with new training sessions or new workouts or, um, you know, kind of do some change as far as nutrition goes. I like a lot of Martin Rooney stuff. He trains a lot of like MMA and UFC guys, and he's got some, some cool training manuals out there. So those are a little bit more like workout-based books, not really science-based books, uh, but, but those are pretty good. Um, and then I'd say for the mental side of things, there's a really good book out there. I recently finished reading called Psych by Dr. Judd Biasoto. Really, really good book when it comes to tapping into everything from like breathing and visualization and, and psych up techniques. And uh, that one will really allow you to dial in, you know, what, what is truly about 90% of the game, which is all the real estate, all the biological real estate that's above your shoulders, pretty much allows you to really get your, get your head under control and in the game. Um, those, are, those are some of the biggies. Awesome. Awesome. Now that's, that's just really helpful. Um, ben, tell us, what's the best way for people to contact you and find out more about you? Uh, I would say bengreenfieldfitness.com. That's, a, that's kind of a good, good portal, good way to get access to my podcast, my books, my website, my articles, etc. So bengreenfieldfitness.com. Awesome. Cool. Uh, obviously, all of this will be in the show notes on the blog. Um, ben, thank you so much for taking the time today. I know that you're in high demand, and I really do appreciate it. Um, and I, I know this perhaps hasn't been uh, sometimes a difficult discussion. Um, you know, talking about uh, some things. You know, I appreciate you're passionate about that. People perhaps shouldn't have cheat days, and how that is ridiculous. Um, yeah, and and I don't want to come off as an ass, right? Like some people be like, oh, I'd never. I'd never want Ben to give me nutrition advice because he sounds like he'd be so hard and unforgiving. That's not the case. Like I know people mess up. Um, it's not like I have never stumbled and you know <laughs> found myself whatever at a party having had four glasses of alcohol when I know that those extra two were actually pretty toxic for my liver and my kidneys, right? But I'm also um, I'm an advocate of telling things how they are and telling the truth. And you know it, I. I will not deny that I feel horribly about things and feel horrible about myself and, and know that I've, I've done my body a little bit of a failure when I do things like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, so I don't want people to think that, that I think I'm perfect and never make mistakes and nobody should, either. that's not the case, but I do think that not enough people out there are saying, Hey, you know, like the, the, the cheating, for example, that's just, you know, it's just stupid. It's, it's mentally weak. So, you know, that's, but, but at the same time, what I'm trying to tell you is I also experienced those same periods of mental weakness. I have empathy, uh, and, and sympathy as well. And, uh, no, I'm not a complete asshole. <laughs> <laughs> love it. I love that. Um, cool, cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Ben, look, I'm going to let you go on with the rest of your, your busy day. 
Um, but thank you so much for coming on to Corporate Warrior and um, hopefully we'll do a part two in the future. All right, sweet. Thanks awesome. for having me on, Lawrence. All the best. Yeah, bye. Cheers. Later. Bye.